Welcome back to Continuum Meditations Discusses. This episode focuses on my continuing look at the new spin-off TV series 24 Legacy and what I want to do this time uh, is offer a review and an analysis of the last four episodes hours 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Now I haven't done anything for this show since its first two premiere episodes several weeks back so I think now is a good time to catch up. First, um, let me start off by giving an overview of a couple of characters that I didn't examine in my very first video on Legacy, which was in fact an impression of the main and supporting characters who had shown up to that point. Well, there are two whom I didn't mention, one of whom has turned out to be very important to the main story. These characters are Henry Donovan and Thomas Locke. Henry Donovan is the father of Senator John Donovan, and from what we've seen so far, he's a wealthy industrialist, an old oil man, if I'm not mistaken, who is determined to seat his son in the White House as President of the United States. Now, we've learned over the last four episodes that Henry Donovan is involved in the conspiracy to smuggle Ibrahim Ben Khalid's terrorist cell into the country, and in the process of doing that, that Henry has found it somehow reasonable and necessary to sacrifice Eric Carter's ranger unit in order to accomplish this and to point the blame at his son's campaign manager, Neela Mizrani, for the subsequent deaths after Ben Khalid's people murdered those rangers and their families while in search of a flash drive uh, containing a list of sleeper cells inside the United States. And we'll talk more about uh, Henry Donovan a bit later. The next character is Thomas Locke, head of the CTU field operations, which makes him the point man to lead all strategies pertaining to counter-terrorist actions outside CTU H HQ. Uh, things like arrests, surveillance, assaults, etc. And in this position, he joins a host of other leaders of field operations who've gone before him, including, for example, the late Curtis Manning, who at one time was also interim director of CTU. Now what uh, will be interesting to me about Thomas Locke is to see how closely and how well he manages to work with Eric Carter, especially if Carter is given some kind of official position inside CTU, maybe even alongside Rebecca Ingram at that point, who may or may not uh, rejoin CTU in an official capacity. Right now it looks like she is acting as an, uh, in an auxiliary position and of course Eric Carter is acting unofficially uh, with CTU as well in getting getting the Ben Collett cell defeated uh, and stopped from uh, enacting any more terrorist attacks on American soil. Now having summarized those two characters and their appearance thus far, let's get into hours 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. The major factors of hour, hour 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. were, uh, number one, Keith Mullins has been cleared as a possible traitor who may have leaked the locations and cover identities of Eric's unit to the Ben Collett terror cell, so he's no longer a suspect in that regard and Rebecca Ingram and Eric Carter both now realize that they can trust him in their hunt to stop Jadala bin Khalid, Ibrahim bin Khalid's son, from enacting any more terrorist attacks in his father's name. We also know by now that Neela Mizrani has been fingered as the traitor who gave up Eric's unit to Ibrahim bin Khalid's son, Jadala. Uh, we also know at this point that Henry Donovan was in fact involved in a conspiracy to get Eric's unit, unit killed and get the bin Khalid cell inside the country undetected. We know also that Eric is, well, we can see, I believe anyway, that we can see that Eric is continuing to change and is being further drawn into the darker side, the darker world of counterterrorism. And I think, as I'm looking at it, that this is in fact affecting his relationship with his wife, Nicole, who is also herself feeling increasingly isolated from Eric. She doesn't understand him, or she feels in a way that she doesn't understand him. And from what I can see, she's starting to lean more and more on Eric's drug-dealing big brother, Isaac, in the interim. In our 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., uh, the accused Neela Mizrani ardently protests her innocence, and Senator John Donovan seems to be the only one to believe her despite all of the damning evidence that is presented against her. The senator's father, Henry, meanwhile makes these weak ascents to 
how you don't really know someone and uh, how people carry or wear two faces one which they let people see and the other one which is uh, maybe the real one I guess from his perspective but all of this makes John Donovan very suspicious of his father's willingness to just throw Neela under the bus so easily after knowing her for so long and he begins to doubt what his father has to say now what happens as a result is that John confronts his dad who reluctantly admits that he was involved in the whole sordid thing uh, and that uh, Neela was framed, but he doesn't want to admit to what degree or to what end, save for getting his son elected, that he's gotten himself involved in this conspiracy. Now, although I gotta say that I was pleased to see both Keith Mullins and Neela Mizrani were not the culprits in this tidy twist of betrayal and treason, Anyone who has watched the original 24 series realizes that conspiracies like this don't end with one lone businessman. Uh, just like Jonas Hodges before him, or even Jack's own father, Philip Bauer, both of whom were involved with others in conspiracies against the United States and his people, it is more than likely that Henry Donovan is working with other powerful men like himself in a much deeper plot. Now, we don't know to what end that plot is, but I have to believe that it goes way beyond allowing some lunatic group of terrorists to attack the country. And I have to believe that Henry Donovan's loyalty to this group goes well beyond just getting his son seated as president. That's my personal take on the matter after having watched so many years of the original 24 series. And if they're going to follow the 20 formula, as I like to call it, then I think we're going to very readily and easily see that there is a secret cabal behind Henry Donovan that he just does not want to give up. Now this leads us to Eric's actions in this episode to capture and interrogate a man named Gabriel who helped the Ben Khalid uh, cell get into America. Gabriel is a former employee of the defunct private military company Starkwood, founded and led by the deceased Jonas Hodges. Now this is a direct original 24 series tie-in. Jonas Hodges was part of the Prion Variant Cabal, a secret group of industrialists who conspired to attack the United States through a group of terrorists led by a man named E.K. Dubaku. This was in the seventh season of the original 24 series. The purpose of the attacks was to force then-President Allison Taylor to turn control of the nation's national security over to this cabal so that they could control the nation through it through their, uh, these emergency powers that would be granted to Jonas Hodges and his group. Well, that plot failed. As a consequence, Jonas Hodges was killed to cover the Prion variant cabal's tracks, and only one other of their members was taken down at the end of day seven of the original series. So what happened to all of the Starkwood employees and the other Prion variant conspirators? Well. We assume that most of these employees were probably prosecuted by the government and the other conspirators more than likely got away. But was everyone brought to justice? And that's a good question to ask. Well, apparently not. This man, Gabriel, is a former Starkwood employee, as I said, who went into business apparently in the 24 Legacy se series. Now, we find out that he went into business for himself after Starkwood went down. And when Eric Carter ultimately confronts him with evidence that he helped to get Ben College people into America, this guy slits his own throat rather than be captured alive by CTU. Now this, uh, I mean, now maybe you probably would say, well, the guy killed himself. Maybe he really, really didn't want to go to jail. And sure, I'd agree with that. But let me also propose this to you. Whoever this Gabriel guy worked for, his loyalty and more than likely fear of these people was way more was a way more powerful motivator than just not wanting to be imprisoned. Uh, he said also that he's not a terrorist but a patriot. That's something we've heard before from men like Walter Cummings, uh, James Nathanson, Christopher Henderson, even a former president of the United States in the 24 timeline, Charles Logan as they all justified aiding and abetting terrorist attacks against the people of the United States from very high positions of trust, power, and authority. So maybe we can also conjecture that this dude, Gabriel, somehow really believed that what he was doing was, was also somehow right and good for the nation too. And that's yet to be seen, but I throw that conjecture out there because as we've seen in the original 24 series, there are a lot of characters who act uh, to do 
very bad things because they believe they're doing something very good in the end. The end justifies the means. It's always one of those things, those r types of rationales that is used to when bad people want to justify doing bad things. So now, as the hour goes on, however, in this hour of 24 Legacy, we also see that Amira Dudayev is having second thoughts about her involvement in this whole sordid mess too, despite her brother Kassan's insistence. And while I'm here, let me also mention that Kassan, as I said, is Amira Dudayev's brother. This is the unseen brother that we didn't know anything about in the first couple of hours of the 24 Legacy show, but who shows up in, I think, the third hour, ultimately. And, um, yes, the third hour. And uh, he shows up to uh, help his sister uh, murder, not himself, but to murder her ex-boyfriend, Drew Phelps. So, uh, Kassan is finally seen uh, after, you know, this couple of couple of episodes in which he wasn't there. Now, as Amira is not really like her brother, we can see this. She hesitates to be part of this whole scheme to kill people. She doesn't like the idea, but somehow or another, even though she doesn't like it and her conscience is not with her in this, she goes along with it because... She seems to be somewhat afraid of her brother, but she also reveres and loves him enough to do what he says, despite the fact that she knows in her own heart that the things that she's doing are wrong. And she especially hesitates when it comes time to kill her ex-boyfriend, Drew Phelps. And as he lays helpless in a hospital bed, uh, Amira struggles with herself to kill him in the manner in which her brother recommended that she do, but... When he wakes up, finally, and sees her standing over him after all of this time when he finally realized that she was, in fact, planning to do something, uh, carry out some kind of terrorist action, as he wakes up in, in the hospital bed and sees her looming over him, in a panic, he begins to struggle with her, even though he's very injured and can barely defend himself. Well, in a panic of her own after after trying to quiet him and letting and trying to let him know that she is not going to kill him he's struggling with her she's struggling back and in this whole big panic between the two of them for different reasons Amira kills him anyway a little bit seems a bit inadvertently but nonetheless the deed is done and now she's a murderer so at this point I began to question whether or not Amira thinks there's really no going back after this She's actually done something that she didn't want to do, done the ultimate sin, if you will. She's, she, she's become a murderer, and now there's really no point of return that there can be for her. I did wonder if Amira was thinking that in her mind, which is why she decided to go forward anyway. But as we go forward, we find out that there's tension inside the Ben Khalid terror cell as well. Jadala Ben Khalid, Ibrahim Ben Khalid's son, and the successor of his terror cell movement. Jadala bin Khalid is now the leader and his lieutenant Kusuma wants to go ahead and attack now while Jadala bin Khalid believes that it is best to adhere to his deceased father's plan and have all 15 of their sleeper cells inside the United States attack at once. And this is where we get into our 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. By now, Neela Mizrani is finally cleared of the accusation against her. Uh, Rebecca Ingram lies to Keith Mullins about her involvement in helping Eric Carter escape CTU with Ben Grimes so that they can go to meet Gabriel. The Ben Khalid flash drive is damaged, and Jadala Ben Khalid's right hand, Kasuma, is totally insistent that they use the information that they've managed to get off it so far to activate at least one of the cells, or the only cell that they can activate at this time to carry out uh, an attack against the United States. Now that cell is, of course, the Dudyev cell, which is comprised of Kassan Dudyev and his sister Amira. Now Jadala bin Khalid wants to follow his father's plan and demands that the flash drive info be recovered in full. But Kasuma wants to go ahead, and he does in fact go ahead and activates the Dudyev cell on his own. And this forces Jadala to make an example of him and blast him in the head because Jadala does not want the rest of his men to doubt his authority or his resolve in carrying out his plans exactly as he believes those plans need to be carried out. 
Now, as I was watching this, I thought to myself, you know what, I can see both sides of this argument. Kasuma is in a use it or lose it mode, while Jadala basically says, I want it all! Kasuma does have something of a minor point, in my opinion. Even if two to three attacks were to happen, if they were to able to recover perhaps two or three more pieces of information to activate a couple of more cells, even if two or three successful attacks could be potentially carried out, they could be crippling in the short term if they are of enough severity and high value. But I can also see Jadala's argument as well. And I think its argument is probably even more sound from that standpoint. If all 15 cells strike simultaneously, the demoralization, the fear, and the confusion will hold the nation to ransom by showing the people that their politicians and security forces are powerless to protect them and that the only effective way to stop these tragedies is to acquiesce to the terrorists' demands. Of course, in the process, you will also be submitting to the aims of their concealed masters as well, but most people won't know anything about that. They'll just know something about the terrorists who attacked the country. But Jadala's strategy doesn't pan out, not yet anyway, because he's too late to tell the Dudievs to stand down. In fact, he can't reach them for some reason, and Kassan Dudiev prepares to go forward with the attack as planned. But again, in classic 24 form, there's a complication. Kassan and Amira's father shows up, and he already knows what his children are up to, but like any good father, he tests them to see if they will tell him the truth before he tells them he already knows what's going on. Now, throughout all this, we see clearly that Amira is still looking for a way out of this situation that does not involve her having to kill more people and without having to oppose her brother, who she obviously loves but is also, as I said before, somewhat afraid of. I mean, she's already killed someone, someone she cares about, as a matter of fact. So when Dad shows up, she's relieved to see him, and she hopes secretly that he will somehow be able to intervene and stop her brother and herself from going through with what they've planned to go through with and hurting anybody else. Well, this doesn't work out. And it ends in a conf confrontation between Kassan and his dad, and as a result, of that confrontation, Papa Dudyev is bound and gagged to prevent him from interfering. Meanwhile, Eric's drug-dealing brother, Isaac, wants to know who else may have betrayed him after his girlfriend, Aisha, tried to have him killed by a rival drug dealer. Uh, and Isaac goes berserk after all of this and starts to interrogate his whole team, distrusting everybody around him, eventually even including Nicole, his brother's wife. And as we've discussed before in a previous video, that was also Isaac's one-time uh, ex-girlfriend. Now, I probably should say right here that, to, quite frankly, I'm not really feeling this whole drug-dealing, bad boy, big brother, little brother stole my girlfriend thing. This, for me, is not any more than a distraction, personally. Uh, ever since the show started, I understood that they were taking pains to show us how Eric and his brother were from the hood, right, from the other side of the tracks, and how Eric took one road, the high road, making himself respectable, while his older brother took the other road and became an outlaw. Okay, I get that. But what I'm looking at when I see Isaac right now, and pretty much all I'm seeing when I look at him right now, is a low-life criminal, an unstable man who is double-minded in many ways, and who still has unresolved feelings for Nicole that he's subtly trying to rekindle by putting on his sad puppy dog face. A face, quite frankly, that Nicole is being tempted to fall for despite the fact that she is intellectually, that she intellectually knows better. Uh, you know, but the guy is good at playing on Nicole's emotions and her natural nurturing instincts as a female, so this may be part of what is happening there. But what gets me about this whole angle, besides the fact that the brothers, Isaac and Eric, went in two different directions, is how does all of this help us to gain any insight into Eric, the main hero and protagonist of the story? And how does it help us understand or gain insight into how he will grow into the character that he is to become as the series progresses? I don't see the character arc and how it fits into the whole I'm from the hood thing. And it's really annoying me. 
Now, if you want to, you can contrast this with Jack Bauer, who was from a very wealthy upper crust family, as revealed in day six of the original show, and say that they're trying to show differences between Eric and Jack. That's fine. But we didn't even know what kind of family Jack came from until well into the series, and so it really made no difference as to how we perceived him until then. But even knowing where Eric comes from now, up front, at the beginning of the series, tells me nothing about where he's going right now, as, so far anyway, all this is doing is demonstrating background. It doesn't show how it affects how he thinks. It doesn't show how he how it affects how he takes action in the larger world and what the consequences will be as a result of that. Well, I don't know. So I guess we'll have to find out, but I'm really not feeling this I'm from the hood thing right now. And so I really hope that they show us how that has consequences to the character and his behavior. Not just how he talks or how he relates to his brother or people from that side, of, from that uh, end of the, of the spectrum, if you want to call it that. So we move on into hour 5 through 6 p.m. And as this, uh, as this episode opens, we see that uh, one of the things that has happened is that Eric is standing over the, or kneeling over the body of his fallen comrade, the last of his squad to die, Ben Grimes. And of course, those of you who have, who have watched the episode or should watch the series to this point, should I say, you know that Ben Grimes was killed by one of Gabriel's men in the previous episode. But what I was thinking as I watched this particular scene was the Ranger Creed, Never Shall I Fail My Comrades, which was in fact quoted by Eric to Ben in one of the previous episodes. And I wondered if this is exactly what Eric was thinking as Ben lay dead before him on the ground and if Eric actually did in fact feel that after all this time he had failed Ben uh, all these time trying to help him all of this time trying to uh, help him recover from what he went through when they were overseas and yet now he's dead after all I, I just wondered if that kind of failure led to the kind of elemental fury that we later see in Eric as he now demands to be put on Thomas Locke's strike team against Jadala bin Khalid. Eric, Eric is furious and we see that portrayed very effectively uh, by Corey Hawkins in the episode uh, but he, he really he doesn't just request, he demands to be put on the strike team. He wants to be on this takedown team so, so ardently because now it is time to make this man, Jadala bin Khalid, pay for not only the murder of his squad and the last remaining member of that squad aside from himself, but also for attacking his wife and as Eric will soon come to learn at some point, uh, his brother will be taken eventually as well. So, while I think, Eric, however, this is something I wanted to point out to you, uh, at least in my thoughts. Morally, I do believe Eric was right. He should be involved. He should be on that strike team. But from an operational perspective, I couldn't help but wonder if director Keith Mullins had a point in that Eric is not CTU, and maybe he should have been sidelined so that CTU could do its job and make this Thomas Locke's ball game now. That would have been interesting perhaps from a dramatic uh, standpoint, from a conflict standpoint. But morally, I do think Eric was right in what he said, that he deserved and had every right to be on that strike team. So anyway, meanwhile though, we do get some more insight into why Kassan Dudiev is so adamant to carry out the terrorist attacks. We see from his interaction uh, with himself and his sister and his father, that he is in fact very angry at his father for not being there when he and his sister were growing up and when their father Mikhail Dudiev was there. Uh, it, it sounded like from what uh, Kassan was saying that Mikhail was abusive towards himself, uh, towards his son and toward uh, his daughter. I don't know by how much, but it doesn't seem that Amira is as as uh, resentful toward her father as her brother is. Um, so you see that 
while Kassan is is very wrathful and vengeful and wants somehow to take that out, not just on his father, but on the world, Amira, by contrast, wants to listen to her father if, I believe anyway, if he says the right things to her, whatever in her mind those right things are. But Kassan, he wants respect. He wants acceptance and even power over his situation and thinks that because of what he has endured at the hands of his father, he has every right to seek those things out by dominating and murdering others. It's twisted, but it's what we've seen from a host of psychopaths and evildoers, uh, from Stalin to Hitler to the most common axe murderer who chops people up and buries them in a basement. Mommy issues, daddy issues, uh, an inability to adapt to common, acceptable societal norms, right? So this is something very interesting, and it, it gives us a lot of insight into how and why Kassan was so easily radicalized. How can I be who I meant to be? Become my dream, follow my destiny. I believe in myself. I'm not afraid, I'm not a whim. It's a very common motif, actually, if you study real uh, people who have become psychopaths. Uh, perhaps they weren't necessarily born that way, but they may have somehow become that way through um, various things that they endured, particularly in childhood, and then that carries over into their teenage years, which ultimately carries over into their adult years. And if they have children, you often see that they can actually pass these things on to their own kids as well and the cycle repeats. Elsewhere uh, in the story, as, as it goes on, Henry Donovan continues to obfuscate and lie about his involvement in the Ben Collett affair. Now, I had a question about this. He's still resisting uh, the mild forms of interrogation that CTU has put him under. He's still refusing to tell his son John the truth, even though he told him the truth back in their family home. Um, he's now, of course, refusing to do it in an official capacity so that he cannot, you know, it's basically his word against his son's word at that point. But what, here's what I was thinking. Is Henry Donovan thinking that by somehow holding back, his son still has a shot at the White House? Maybe he's thinking that John Donovan will become POTUS in spite of everything that happens to himself, that is, to Henry, if it, if it is in his powerful friend's interests that John become president no matter what. However, we do see in the interim that John, seeing that he cannot coax his father to tell the truth out of his own good conscience and loyalty and patriotism to the country, John in the interim decides to withdraw himself from the race. Now again, I ask the question, will Henry, Henry Donovan's powerful interest group permit that? Now, in other parts of the city, uh, Kassan, and Amira, and now the now present David Harris ready the final portions of their attack. But as we see, the newly resurfaced David Harris has second thoughts and decides to back out. And he actually wants to get Amira to join him in standing up against her brother. And he actually takes Kassan's gun, points it at him, tells Amira to get away from her brother, and unfortunately, uh, discharges the weapon, shooting Kassan in the stomach and ultimately killing him. Now, what interested me about this was the whole dynamic that was going on between Amira and David, where, and this was established in the very first episode as well, where he actually believed that Amira had some kind of romantic interest in him, which I think was obviously ho horse pucky from the beginning. I think that that was psychological manipulation on her part to try to get this very weak-minded individual uh, to go along with her plans, and I really don't think she had any interest in, in him at all, although she was willing to engage him uh, psychologically in that regard. She was even willing to engage him as the first episode uh, demonstrated quite effective. Well, it demonstrated it enough anyway. She was even willing to engage him in a sexual fashion in order to gain his trust and in order to, and in order to gain his cooperation. However, once, and he actually believes this to the very end, to the very end of his life. <laughs> and however, once he shoots Kassan, once David shoots Kassan and kills him, this actually forces Amira's hand because as much as she might want David's cooperation and as much as she might even want to get out of this entire plan 
she still loves her brother. Family is very important to Amira. This is very clear. And when he is shot, Amira takes a knife or some other instrument and basically knifes David Harris in the back and finally kills him with a, with a blow to the heart. Now, Amira is so distraught by her brother's death that it ultimately galvanizes her to carry out the attack in his name despite whatever her father told her, in spite of her own doubts about it, in spite of her own conscience and her uh, ultimate, ultimate desire to not be a part of this, it galvanizes her to go ahead and, and carry out the attack. She tells her father goodbye, and she later martyrs herself on the George Washington Bridge, which is the target assigned to her and her brother by Jadala bin Khalid. And as we see later on, the father is left weeping bitterly at the end of the episode. And I have to say, I really did feel sorry for the dad. The man has lost his entire family now. His wife apparently has died perhaps months or years before, uh, leaving him as a single father. He raises his two children alone uh, at, to some degree at some point in their lives. And now both of them are dead. Uh, his son has been a severe disappointment apparently in his life. Uh, even though he loves his son and has tried to guide him in the right way, at least for whatever part of his life that Mikhail Dudayev was there for his son. But apparently it wasn't enough, at least not in the son's mind. Anyway, the father is now totally distraught. And you can see that in his face when he's watching the explosion, the, the plume of smoke rising up over the, over the horizon. And he now knows that his daughter has carried out this attack and that she more than likely is dead, which of course is true. And so I, I really felt bad for Mikhail Dudyev in that regard because as much as he tried to get through to his daughter in particular, nothing that he said to her ultimately stopped her. You could tell that she wanted to listen to him, but the hold that her brother had on her and whatever other psychological dynamics were going on were just too strong for him to break through and ultimately it cost both of his children their lives and so now this man his children are dead and he has nothing effectively left of his family this is a very that was a very sad moment and i really felt really felt compassion for mikhail dudyev at that point now in the last scenes uh in a very predictable 24 style move in my opinion falls right into that 20 formula that i discussed in, a, in that previous video jadala bin khalid sends his men to kidnap nicole in a bid to get eric to cooperate with him in getting the flash drive fully functional again and in the process of this kidnapping they shoot two ctu agents who were sent to take nicole back to ctu headquarters and they kidnap Nicole, they shoot several of Isaac's men uh, and kill them, and in the process of that, they manage to capture and kidnap Isaac himself, okay? It's a very clever move of leverage to force Eric's hand uh, by Jadala bin Khalid. Somewhat predictable in my opinion. I mean, we've seen that plenty of times before in the original 24 series, but one which I think apparently is going to work at least temporarily. Because as we see from the preview for next week's episode, Eric is in fact going to somehow try to enlist um, the aid of Andy Shalowitz, uh, the computer uh, programmer there at CTU, to get to get him to uh, get this flash drive fully functional again. And if they follow the 20 formula, as I believe they will, more than likely what's going to happen is Eric is somehow going to have to sneak uh, Andy Shalowitz out of CTU headquarters and uh, enlist his cooperation without anybody else knowing, maybe even without the even the knowledge of Rebecca Ingram herself, but certainly not David um, uh, Keith Mullins and certainly not anyone else, Thomas Locke or anyone else uh, who might who might try to stop him at that point. So there are six episodes remaining in this first season of the new 24 Legacy TV series. And I have to say that in my opinion, the third episode in order uh, was the best episode. Well, let me rephrase that. I won't say that it was the best episode, but it was the breakout episode of the show, in my opinion, where this show really started to uh, give me the impression that it can, in fact, how should I say it, that it can, in fact, 
uh, step up to the plate. I won't go as far as to say that it can fill the shoes of its predecessor at this point, but I will say it has the potential to step up to the plate and make itself known and recognized as the successor show to the original 24 series. I'm looking forward to seeing what the remaining six episodes give us. I'm hoping that there's going to be uh, more character development for Eric Carter, particularly along the lines that I mentioned earlier in the video. And I'd like to see some of these other interesting, uh, some of these other threads resolved, particularly the thread between, it looks like the character of Aisha is gone, at least for now. Drew Phelps is dead. The Dudayevs are dead. So we're going to see what happens with Jadala bin Khalid and the rest of his, his organization and how they if they can in fact re-energize or reactivate the other cells and what those cells uh, objectives and orders are in the process. So uh, I also would like to see the thread of Isaac Carter resolved in some way that gives meaning to that character as more than simply uh, you know the, the average street hoodlum uh, with a um, obviously successful drug organization but um, uh, I'd like to see him do something a little bit more than that. So, give some meaning to that character as well. And um, it looks like we're going to have an old favorite coming back uh, next Monday in the form of Tony Almeida. I don't know how he's going to fit into the storyline, but it seems like he is going to be of some um, prevalence, perhaps, in dealing with Henry Donovan. Uh, and maybe in other areas as well. So I look forward to seeing what's going to happen with him. They've been uh, pretty reasonable at tying in old, old threads, old flames, if you will, to the uh, to the new series without going overboard with it. I think that that's good. But at the same time, they are holding back a little bit and being reserved is also a good thing. So uh, let's see what they do with Mr. Almeida next week. And uh, we'll see how the rest of the series pans out. So until next time, 24 fans. Live another day.